Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hey, I'm Scott Hambrick. And I'm Carl Shute. And we're going to talk today about Dorothy Sayers' paper, The Lost Tools of Learning. It's not really an essay that she wrote. It's her notes from a a speech that she gave at Oxford in 1947. And uh, she put her notes all together and polished them up and published it again in 1948. And we actually put this in our handbook at Online Great Books because we think it's a big deal. Yeah, I think it's a gateway drug. To what? Uh, Well, for homeschoolers, it's a gateway drug. For anybody who wants to redo your education... You read it and you realize, wow, <laughs> I really don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It almost make you want to give up, though. She's so smart. Yeah. Uh, she's an interesting person. We, this isn't about her biography. You shouldn't have to know everything about an author before you read something and judge whether it's worthwhile. But uh, she's lived from 1893 to 1957. She was one of the first people to get a degree from Oxford one of the first women to get a degree from Oxford, if that matters to you. She worked in advertising for a long time. And there's some famous advertising campaigns, which she had a part in. Uh, she wrote detective stories. We need to talk about that advertising a little bit. You know, these um, a lot of these Guinness uh, reprint, like lithograph advertisements you see, like the one with the toucan and the working men that drink Guinness to be strong and do their work all day. She wrote many of those slogans and worked with a, an artist to to create those. A lot of that is her work. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the slogan, it pays to advertise, is her. So there's bits of, of her work that have become part of our language. She had a blip, bit of a, I don't even want to go into her life details. It's a little bit tumultuous in her young life. You can read fictionalized versions of that in her detective novels. She was real smart. Uh, She was a believer in the Anglican Church. She was in the the C.S. Lewis circle. She knew those people. Can you imagine playing cards with all those cats? (laughs) I would just sit in the corner and listen. It's like, I always want to be, when I'm in a a musical group, I always want to be the worst musician in the group. Right. Because it makes you better. You hate to be, the worst thing is to be the best one in the group. The smartest person I know would be the dumbest guy in that card game. With yeah. Lewis and Sayer. She translated Dante's Divine Comedy. Mm-hmm. I have it. Yep. That's a that's a good one. Uh, they just recently, they Penguin just recently kicked that thing out, out again. So there's a fresh Dorothy Sayer, uh, Dante. Yeah. Even if you have a, a different Dante that you like, you should probably pick up hers for the very, very cool footnotes. All of those names, all of those people, the, the, geolo- um, the geography of hell. Uh, if you want to know all of that, it's really well done in Sayers 3 volume set. So I highly recommend it. I like it when awesome people do translations of these books, like the Hobbes, Thucydides. Mm-hmm. So good. So cool. Yeah. I read the detective books every few years once I forget who did it. <laughs> How many years does that take? It's about three. So, uh, so as you get older, you can read them more and more often. <laughs> right. Right. But you read these things and... Well, the detective eventually, I don't know. I don't want to spoil it. Eventually, there's two detectives. Uh, there's uh, Lord Peter Whimsey and Harriet Vane, and they work together, and there's a romance and all of that. But they just talk to each other. They'll switch languages. You know, one minute they're in English, then it's Italian and French, and and, <laughs> and there's literary allusions all over the place. And this isn't James Patterson. You know, this is, <laughs> it's it's some highbrow stuff. It's good fun, though. You can... Even if you don't have Italian or French, you can make it through it. But. I have to point out right now that well, we, we do this on Zoom. So uh, Carl can see me and I can see him. And then we record. I record my end and he records his end. And, uh, and Brett Vinat, he he puts it all together and makes it sound good for you guys. But Carl's in his office and there are lots of books behind him. And he's wearing real tree camouflage hoodie. And there's a can <laughs> of curs on the desk behind him. <laughs> <laughs> it's from it's from last night, right? <laughs> That's funny. What? 
<laughs> yeah. So uh, no, I'm not very highbrow, but they're they're wonderful mysteries. They're they're really good. You they're not easy to figure out. Some mysteries you can figure it out pretty easily. Uh, with hers, there's like the there's the beginning of one where uh, Whimsy goes to Scotland on vacation, and uh, he's hanging out in a painter's colony, an artist colony. And Sayers gives a list of everything that's on the painter's tray. I, guess, I think the painter mm. gets killed. I can't remember exactly. But every the list of everything on the, the little cart. There's a can of Coors. There might be a can of Coors, but... Carl did it. Either the author or the... or Wim, I think the author kind of mentions... And of course, there was one thing missing, which she doesn't tell you what it was. And the one thing that's missing is the clue to the whole mystery. Mm. But you need to know enough about painting to know what's the one thing missing from the painter's cart. Mm. It's real good. There's one about bell ringers. There's one set in an advertising agency. That one's good. Whimsy goes to work in advertising. Where, of course, there's murder. Right. Truth in advertising. She said yeah. truth in advertising is like yeast in bread. Doesn't take much. Uh, <laughs> but so this essay, Lost Tools of Learning... Yeah. It's from 47. She had already noticed there was some stuff lost <laughs> by 47. Yeah, and I think, incidentally, this is a, a a very good example of the sort of Aristotelian writing. Yeah. Adler's book on how to, how to speak, how to listen, mm. which explains how to make a speech pretty well, I thought. There's ethos, pathos, and logos. So ethos is who am I, why you should care. You know, you introduce yourself. Pathos is why you should, I mean, why you should trust me. That's ethos. Pathos is uh, why you should care. And then logos is the argument. So if you look at this essay, she starts off with who she is and uh, sort of disarms you. And then she tells you why you should care. Why does it matter that we have lost tools of learning? So she starts off that, that I, whose experience of teaching is extremely limited and whose life of recent years has been almost wholly out of touch with educational circles, should presume to discuss education is a matter that surely calls for no apology. So she says, I'm not a teacher. I'm not a teacher at all. And I'm still going to talk about it. And not apologize. Right. And at the end of the paragraph, for if we are not all professional teachers, we have all at some time or other been taught. Even if we learned nothing. Yeah. 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 So you have all been taught, so you can all, uh, just like Sayers, have an opinion on teaching. And just before she says that about being taught, she says that too much specialization is not a good thing. Uh, so she's she's put her, eye, her finger in the eye of these professional educators a little bit. That's going to be one of the themes of the, of the essay is that we make a mistake by teaching subjects as if they're isolated and by filling um, eight years of grade school, four years of high school and four or more years of college with, with subject knowledge. Yeah. Because subject knowledge, uh, so you learn uh, math or you learn biology, but you don't learn how to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the, the tools of learning are about how, learning how to learn. But she doesn't want your knowledge to have edges. She wants it all to touch. You know, she's probably one of those that mixed all of her food up on her plate. <laughs> you don't do that? Yeah, I do. Do you keep, like, there's a, a demilitarized zone between the beans and the, the ham? Oh, no, no. I, my, my food touches. I don't mix it up, but they, they definitely touch. <laughs> Dining with Hamburg. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's see. I, I particularly like, there's some subtle burns here. You know, I can't say this. Worsham made a meme about me saying, dear listener. <laughs> yeah. And so now I'm, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you, dear listener, work in education, don't take it too seriously or take it as seriously as it, ma as it merits, but don't take it like being mean. If it's true, worry about it, but I'm not trying to insult you here by pointing this out. So uh, Sayers talks about what the teachers actually do. Yeah. She's actually very sympathetic in this, I think. She doesn't like it for them. The teaching of 
the liberal arts sadly interferes with what every thoughtful mind will allow to be their proper duties, such as distributing milk, supervising meals, taking cloakroom duty, weighing and measuring pupils, keeping their eyes open for incipient months, measles and chicken pox, making out lists, escorting parties around the Victorian Albert Museum, filling up forms, interviewing parents, and devising end-of-term reports which shall combine a deep veneration for truth with a tender respect for the feelings of all concerned. That's a, a marvelous yeah. catalog. I, I taught for a year in a high school, a private high school, and I still had to do all of that stuff. Did you measure the kids? I, I didn't have to measure them, but there was always a stack of papers, a stack of announcements, a whole bunch of mandated things that I had to do. Yeah. You know, school is a thing. Like, there's a Venn diagram of school and of education, and the two circles don't overlay 100%. They don't hide right. each other. And so school is a, is its own creature, And I sent my kids to the snotty, you know, prep school here in town before we pulled them out of that school and decided to homeschool them. And what I have discovered is that the private schools are excellent at being schools, (laughs) which is actually maybe contrary. Even it might even be like I went to Catoosa High School in Catoosa, Oklahoma, which is a piece of shit. And I was more free to pursue an education there than my kids were in their snotty prep school because they were so busy being a school and testing and trying to prepare them for this one outcome, which is getting a good SAT score, that the kids didn't have time to really do anything but play that game. So the finer the school is nowadays, the more they play that game and the more efficiently they play that game, which I think is a detriment. Yeah. So you have to think... One way to identify stuff is to figure out what the final cause of it is. Um, that's a little Aristotle for you. The tell us, the final cause, what's the purpose of a school? Right. It might not be your child's best interest. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, it, it might be something different. It might be uh, getting funding. You know? <laughs> It might be allowing parents to have their kids out of the house for eight hours a day. Yep. Uh, It might not be teaching them to learn so that they can become, you know, fully developed adults capable of leading their own lives. That might not be the goal. Yep. Gatto talks about, you know, excellent schools armoring the minds of the parents and the children against authentic, like needs-based education. When I say needs-based, I need to learn this because there's a thing that's important to me that has a big effect on my life. I have to go pursue it on my own, right? This sort of bootstraps, figure it out, learn it, take it for your own kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Those excellent schools, they serve their final cause really well. Get into school, get into another school with maybe some more scholarships than other people get. But they, they do that to the detriment of the other thing. And uh, because they are successful in giving those kids that final cause, those kids are then steeled to anything else. I was really worried about that. I yanked my kids out. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's uh, places generally do what they're aiming to do. They just might not be aiming to do what you think they are aiming to do. Katusa high school aimed to warehouse uh, redneck children until they could convict them as adults if they screwed up. (laughs) That's what they did. And they're really good at that. As soon as you could be tried as in your majority. Yeah. So she's going to propose to go back to a medieval way of teaching, which right away, you know, medieval middle ages, isn't that the horrible time of plague and, well, it's also the birthplace of the university. I Yep, it's the birthplace of the university, and I have come to believe, and I'll change my mind because I change my mind about everything, but I've come to see the Enlightenment as the product of the medieval. It didn't just sprout out of the ground like a yep. mushroom after a yep. rain. Yeah. Etienne Gilson, it's a fun name to say. It's about as French as I get. He's a French philosopher, became a big scholar on Thomas Aquinas, but he started with Descartes. And what he found was that, uh, I think his dissertation was finding all of the scholastic influence in Descartes. Descartes presents himself as, I'm doing a new thing that nobody's ever done. But he sneaks all sorts of Aristotle in there. And that made Gilson go back further 
and uh, end up with with Brother Thomas. The thing is, if you read medieval stuff, if you read medieval philosophy or theology, it is very well argued. Oh, yeah. So uh, I've read some Dun Scotus. Dun Scotus is worse than Thomas on this. Thomas Aquinas will have a bunch of objections and replies. Wait a minute, worse or better? Better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he'll have 35 objections to his position. Daniel Dennett calls that steel manning like it's new. What's his definition of steel manning? When you state the case of the opposition in such a way that they would say, I wish I had said it like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's the opposite of a straw man, you know? Yeah. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that's the way we did arguments? So we wouldn't say, <laughs> so you're saying. <laughs> so what you're saying is, well, that's that's what the scholastics in the medieval school of writing and yeah. thinking was about. Yeah. If you look at Thomas Aquinas's proofs for the existence of God and you just look at the objections at the beginning, you will be convinced there is no God. <laughs> I know. He gives me whiplash every time I read him. Like, yeah, that's right. No, 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 it's wrong. Every time. Uh, and even if you don't, well, even if you don't get his, follow him to his ultimate conclusions, you'll be a lot smarter about everything yeah. by having, what do all of the smart people say on it? What's the best argument you can make for an opposing position? And that's what the liberal arts do. That's what you do in, in grammar and logic and rhetoric when, you, when you're learning a subject. They knew how to do it. He's a way better atheist than Sam Harris or any of those guys. <laughs> She talks about education. She says, if we were to produce a society of educated people fitted to preserve their intellectual freedom amid the complex pressures of our modern society, we must turn back the wheel of progress some four or 500 years to the point at which education began to lose sight of its true objects towards the end of the Middle Ages. Yeah. That's a big claim. That's a big claim. And so now she's got to back it up uh, because obviously we never go backward. Only right. reactionaries go backwards, people who believe in unicorns and stuff. Because nobody ever had anything right in the past. Right. Right. We're the, we're the pinnacle of history. Mm-hmm. 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 Well, so if, if you've gone the wrong way, if you've ever been driving and you've taken a wrong turn, I believe I did this in Missouri just this past summer, and you go far enough, the only way to go forward is to go back. If you've gone the wrong direction, you got to go backwards to go forwards. My wife's granddad used to say, I don't think we can get there from here. Again, since Hambrick, and I'm not the only person, this isn't original, there's nothing original that I can get at, thinks that the Enlightenment is actually the product of that medieval thought, it makes sense to go, you know, and if you like what you get from the Enlightenment, it's a big old if, but if you like what you get from that and you want to restore that, you can't just go to that. You got to go to the precursors. You got to lay that foundation. So she makes an argue argument for lay, relaying the foundation mm-hmm. because she wants to preserve the Enlightenment, intellectual freedom. She says it right there. She wants to preserve intellectual freedom. Well, all right, okay. So, okay, Dorothy. I wonder. I wonder if they called her Dot. Uh, let's. I wonder if she had a nickname. So she lays out reasons why you might want to do it. So this is her big claim. We've got to go back to medieval. But before she tells you what medieval education was like, she says why you might be uncomfortable with the way things are today. So one of the, the first things she mentioned is the artificial prolongation of intellectual childhood and adolescence. <laughs> yep, I underlined it. Yeah, it's, it, she says it's prolonged into the years of physical maturity. Gosh, it's so weird. I think everybody, I think everybody that's over... Mm, 38 years old is just baffled by how long it takes people to start adulting. I hate that word. I do too. It pisses me off. You hate problematic. I hate adulting. I hate adulting too, actually. I had a a young friend. We're still connected on social media. So if he listens to this, hello, David. But I had him as a student and he would post things on Facebook about the spider in his apartment and how he now has to move. Because he can't kill the spider. And, I, you know, he's a 20, 26-year-old young man. I'm thinking, there's two things. First, kill the spider. And second, if you're afraid to kill the spider, don't post about it on social media and say you're having difficulty adulting. Struggle with it. Get the vacuum and suck it up if you don't want to If you don't want to smash it. I don't know. Find a way to do it. Uh, but he's been in school his whole life, and he's always had somebody else to kill the spider for him. Yeah. 
Back to my wife's granddad. <laughs> uh, I think he went to school through eighth grade. He would be, let me see, he would be 95 years old now. He passed away some years ago. I think he'd be 95. Maybe he'd be 92. And he went to school through the eighth grade. And this is, uh, so he he, he dro- dropped out, dropped out. See, they say mm-hmm. shit like that. Before Sayers speaking here, before World War II. And a smart guy. Had an extraordinary memory. Read a lot. He was in the manual arts. He made plastic body, interior body panels for American Airlines. Uh, They would bring him uh, a body panel, you know, an interior molded plastic panel with, and they had no molds uh, for the left side and say, we need a mirror image of this. And he had no tooling, no measured drawings, and he would crank out a handmade mirror image. I mean, the guy had geometry, he had spatial reasoning, he could read, he was a technician, he knew things, he was valuable. And he got all that he needed by the time he was in the eighth grade. His intellectual childhood and adolescence was not prolonged. Right. And now you have to, we think, we're we're starting to think that college is a right, that everybody has to go to college or somehow they're not adults. I think people have abrogated their responsibility to help their children transition into independence and adulthood to the university rather than help them bridge that gap from their own home you know, from the, the mm-hmm. their home of origin to their own household. You know, the kid graduates from high school and these parents just say, you know, well, let's wipe, they're done. Send them to college. Like that has training wheels on it, but it doesn't. You're just throwing them out of an airplane with a parachute. But mm-hmm. the next reason she says that we need to return to the educational ways of old is that people have become susceptible to the influence of advertisement and mass propaganda to an extent hitherto unheard of and unimagined. And she believes that educating them properly would uh, steal them against these things. So this is 1947, and this is Europe. And she's in the advertising business. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, People are susceptible. If something trends on Twitter, people somehow think it's important. The thing I found out, I have been cutting myself off from a lot of stuff. Mm. I haven't watched a football game in four or five years. And baseball, I mean, I, I used to watch a whole lot of sports, and I, I haven't flipped on the television to over the air in a long, long time. Once you're out of that constant bombardment of advertisement and mass propaganda, there's a lot more room to think and realize just how much of the things that I thought were important were because I saw somebody worried about it. Right. How little any of that matters in real life, you can find out once you're detached from it. Uh, but people, people are susceptible to words. We just had a friend ask the two of us, Carl, uh, well, in a podcast a couple of weeks ago, we said uh, that the internet wasn't real. And he said, Scott, Carl, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Carl said that uh, the internet is the flickering uh, shadows on the cave wall, you know. And I said that nothing, when something happens on the internet, nothing really happens. I still stand by that. It's real for a certain value of real. You know, it, it's kind of real, but most of what you see is manufactured. Uh, it's put there for you. If you use uh, the popular search engines, for example, the search results are designed. They're not random. Yeah. They're designed. I would say the internet used to be more real. Yeah. Back, say, in 92 or 93. It, it has become television, you know, as we speak to you, dear yeah. listener, over the internet. <laughs> it's become television. And even at online great books where we ostensibly use the internet to run the business a hundred years ago, not a hundred years ago, let me not be flippant. 35 years ago, you would have torn a card out of a magazine for online great books and filled that out and mailed it in. And we would have put you in touch with somebody in your area running a group and then mailed your stuff to you. It just does that. And I think a way that we're a little more real is we're mostly just taking Adler's list we're not picking a list of books that are trending. No. So we're insulated a little bit from from the mass propaganda because we're not following it. You know, we're not reading Aristotle because he trended on Twitter. Wouldn't that be cool? We could make it happen. Hmm. Hashtag Aristotle. But then I'd have to go on Twitter. Yeah, that's not worth it. Let's pretend like Twitter doesn't exist. 
Her next point is that um, if you ever listen to a debate among adult and presumably responsible people, you just hear how awful these debates are. She essentially ba- – uh, and she also says, uh, uh, have you ever pondered upon the extremely high incidence of irrelevant matter which crops up at a committee meeting? Oh, gosh. You know, meetings are terrible. And so she thinks that people's inability to speak to the issue, to speak concisely, and to stay on on task – uh, when when speaking is uh, the fault of education, I'm going to say yes and to Dottie. See, in, mm-hmm. in, in Oklahoma, she wouldn't be Dot; it would be Dottie. Would she have a middle name? Yeah, <laughs> Dottie May. She. There's also an IQ thing too, but that's all right. Yeah, I, I, I've been to meetings. Um, my year, well, I be, I was in academia for a long time. There were meetings. They were very. They were always ten times longer than they had to be. Her middle name's Lee, Dottie Lee. Oh, she was from Oklahoma. Holy, she might be my aunt. (laughs) I'm very fond of her. I'm going to think of her as Dottie Lee from now on. She's one of my friends. I had an aunt named Beulah, and then her cousin was Eula. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Some old names. I I had a great uncle whose name was spelled O-M-E-G-A, his middle name, Audie. O M E G A, O M G O M E G A, and they pronounced it Omija. <laughs> and I asked my grandmother one time. I was like, "What does that mean?" She says, "Well, because I hadn't seen it spelled." And I said, "What does that mean?" She says, "Well, it's out of the Bible." It is. <laughs> but these are people that read by themselves, right? Right, Omija. They it's didn't know. It's like, uh, did you ever uh, see Seven Brides or Seven Brothers? I, One thousand years ago. And the uh, the brothers are all named out of the Bible, so it's uh, Adam, Benjamin, Caleb, Daniel, Ephraim, Frank, right? <laughs> and then Gideon, I think. And Frank, what what's Frank short for? Frankincense. Awesome. They should have had more kids, so they could have got to Meshach, <laughs> Shadrach, Z- Zerubbabel. We're getting distracted, but. That's all right. So the inability to speak, if you've ever been to a meeting, if, you, if you've never had the joy of serving on committees and being in meetings, just flip on a talking head show for a few minutes yep. and see if the talking heads actually respond to the thing the other talking head said, or if they even notice that they haven't. Their goal isn't even, they're there to say something very quickly. Think of the TELUS. They're accomplishing the goal that they have pretty yep. well. Uh, but it's not a debate, and I don't think they'd know if they did it. She has other complaints. Writers fail to define the terms they use. Yep. If you listen to it, you think they're using freedom in different ways. They they don't mean by that word what I mean by that word. Clearly. They don't define their terms. She says their syntax is terrible, so you can listen to what they say or read what they say and still not know what the heck it means. And then this is a big one. I've actually numbered this. This is my number six. Do you ever find... That young people, when they have left school, not only forget most of what they have learnt, but forget also or betray that they have never really known how to tackle a new subject for themselves. Yeah. All you should need, I think this is all you should need if you have a reasonable level of intelligence. You need to have grade school and a library card. How far does grade school go? Is that sixth grade? For us, it's eight. Okay. You heard it here first, guys. Carl says, <laughs> Carl says, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. As long as you got, you know, helpful, you have helpful parents. Uh, I think you're, I think we're good to go with that. Well, if you actually accomplished what she's got planned here, yeah, you know, if you have learned how to learn, then you can be done and you can spend the time studying subject matter, but now you'll know how to do it. And then you could follow a subject matter that interests you. I have sat in so many classrooms full of people that didn't want to be there. And I can't blame them. Yep. Well, they weren't there to learn that. They were there to check that box so they could get right. that paper, so they could get that job. And you know. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the diploma, by the way, this is my version of medieval history. Okay, so universitas means guild. It does not mean university. Okay. It's a guild. I'm paraphrasing history here. So if you go back and read Augustine, 
he talks about being a teacher of rhetoric. And the problem is the students would take his class up until the time tuition was due, and then they'd drop. And then they'd go take somebody else's class. Well, in the Middle Ages, they came up with an invention called the Diploma, issued by the bishop. The guild got together. The teachers banded together. And uh, you could only get the Diploma. What would cause you not to get a Diploma that you've earned? You didn't pay your bill. Right. You have library fines or something, you know? <laughs> you, you show up on graduation and they don't hand you the diploma because you didn't send the check in. That's what a diploma is. It's a device to assure payment to the guild. It's not a certification that you're smart. Right. It's a certification it's a, that all your bills are paid. It's a receipt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I have a few of them around here somewhere. I think that's real important. That's what we want. We want to be able to tackle a new subject. We want to know how to do it. And if the education isn't doing that, what's the, I don't know what the point of it is. Um, for me, number seven, do you often come across people for whom all their lives a subject remains a subject divided by watertight bulkheads from all other subjects so that they experience very great difficulty in making an immediate mental connection between, say, algebra and detective fiction, sewage dip disposal and the price of salmon, etc.? You know, I can't talk about that. I, I don't know anything about that. So we have the cult of the expert. We bring in the expert to talk about something, and you can't talk about it because you are not an expert. This is one of my hobby horses, Matt. Um, I said Matt. See, I do this other podcast with this other guy, so when I have these headphones on and I have this microphone. How would I, how would I imitate Matt? Step on my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> We love you, Matt Reynolds. When you have experts, when the, when the only people that act in an arena are specialists in that arena, you end up with incremental improvements in that arena. But when you bring people to bear on a problem that is outside of their area of expertise and you have uh, the guy come to the problem but about uh, sewage disposal and the price of salmon and he studied algebra and paper manufacturing – that's when you get really interesting and novel uh, solutions to problems that could not have been gotten at mm -hmm. by the specialist. They yeah. don't have knowledge of anything outside of the problem. And if you want quantum leaps in knowledge formation or problem solving or whatever, you've got to bust the silos down and you've got to bring in weird people with weird solution set, uh, uh, with weird uh, tool sets in their minds and, we do less and less and less of that. You know, Henry Ford famously said that if he had listened to the consumer, he would have just gotten them faster horses. <laughs> you have to bring a weird mind to a transportation problem to get a Model T. Or otherwise, you're just, you know, you just keep polishing the horses. Right. Right. And, well, I think on the, if I may get metaphysical for a moment. Mm, I, I think... love it when you do that. I slow, think the slow down, <laughs> the higher you get, it's all one subject. Yeah. What is that um, subject? Metaphysics. First philosophy. Yeah. It's all uh, aspects of one thing. So sewage and salmon prices, they're all part of one huge body of knowledge. The Carl Lindian monad, the one thing. <laughs> Parmenides was right. I'm going to put up posters that say that. <laughs> Parmenides was right about being. I'm just gonna make little little uh, bumper stickers right. and put them everywhere. Knowledge silos, subject silos, uh, lead to stifled solution uh, creation, and are a big problem. And she sees this medieval learning system, which we'll get, we're gonna we're gonna shine light on that here in a minute. But she sees that as a way to break down the silos. And we can see when we learned how to educate people by the trivium by and by you end up with a newton you end up with a galileo you end up with the things that we got those things mm -hmm. didn't just come up out of the dirt they were products of what came before them and that's what she wants to go back to yeah the the scientists in the the great big scientific revolution these were all people that were they were not specialists no. they were mostly gentlemen who had the money and the time to go and poke around in experimental science, but they had enough edge. If they had thought, well, I'm a gentleman. I, uh, this is not my area. I need an expert. Right. You know, you wouldn't have uh, laws of thermodynamics. Well, you'd still have them, but nobody would know them. 
how many more of these these complaints do we want to do? I like the one <laughs> she talks about the level of discourse and the level of literature, <laughs> and uh, she's quoting from the newspaper. Miss Basel has a perfect command of English. Oh gosh, she said at once, and a marked enthusiasm for London. So the newspaper's example of a perfect <laughs> command of English was, oh gosh. Yeah, I can imagine that uh, Miss Dottie here had a whole clippings file full of a uh, crap that she clipped out of the London paper and everything, you know. Yep. So she makes a good point uh, about when people make fun of the Middle Ages, they will bring up an example of uh, the angels on a head of a pin yeah, yeah, as the stereotypical thing that medieval philosophers would worry about. And she makes the point that it is actually a really good exercise. Yeah. Let's state the question. But that's one of the people's uh, gripe about Thomas is like he spends a bunch of time talking about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. I think she says the point of a pin. Um, mm -hmm. But she says, oh, no, no, you missed the point. <laughs> It's not about the pen. Yep. It's about understanding terms. What does it mean to be somewhere? So how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Well, you have to figure out. It doesn't even matter if they're angels. It matters. What does it mean to be there? How can an angel be in a place? Isn't Does an angel have a body? So you think about the connection between body and place. Uh, or can you sort of be, if you're an intellectual being, can you be there by thinking about it how many people can think about the head of a pin can i read what she says about this i think it's i, I actually yes please wrote that we needed to read this aloud she says now people consider it to be a matter of faith to know how many archangels could dance on the point of a needle it was never a matter of faith but it was simply a debating exercise whose set subject was the nature of angelic substance were materials angels material and if so did they occupy space the answer usually a judge correct is, I believe, that angels are pure intelligences, not material, but limited, so that they may have location in space, but not extension. An analogy might be drawn from human thought, which is similarly, similarly non-material and similarly limited. Thus, if your thought is concentrated upon one thing, say the point of a needle, it is located there in the sense that it is not elsewhere. But although it is there, it occupies no space there, and there's nothing to prevent an infinite number of different people's thought being concentrated upon the same needle point at the same time. Right. And then a little bit further down, the practical lesson to be drawn from the argument is not to use words like there in a loose and unscientific way without specifying whether you mean located there or occupying space there. In other words, come to terms, like Adler would say. Yeah. I got to keep reading her. Scorn in plenty has been poured out upon the medieval passion for hair splitting. But when we look at the shameless abuse made in print and on the platform of controversial expressions with shifting and ambiguous connotations, we may feel it in our hearts to wish that every reader and hearer had been so defensively armored by his education to be able to cry <laughs> distinguo to distinguish. Yeah, it's Latin for I make a distinction. You know, it's like saying it depends. But then having a very clear way in which it depends. Right. You know, should I sumo deadlift? It depends. Then you make distinctions. What are we talking about? What are we trying to train? What are we developing? It, all of that stuff. And where people go wrong is they don't see the distinction. Very common for people not to see the distinction. And that's when they say, Scott, so what you're saying is... <laughs> No, that's not what I'm saying. You should read more carefully and be capable of reading more carefully and understand what I'm actually saying. You know? That's me angry just thinking about it. She thinks, and I agree with her, she thinks that reading, writing, and even the use of spoken word is all technological and that you must receive training in using the technology. You wouldn't just put somebody on a backhoe and expect them to not tear something up. Language requires training to use properly and deftly. Yeah. And I want to add more. It is also words are weapons. Ooh. Do you remember that stupid PSA? Words are like fists. Do you remember that? Yeah. They aren't really like fists. but no, they're not. Only somebody that had never been punched in the face would say that <laughs> words were like fists. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, no, they're, it's not, they're not physical violence. That's not what I'm saying. I, I, I don't want to no. distinguo. I wish to make a distinction. 
they are weapons in the mental and spiritual realm. They can have an effect. And if you are not prepared to defend yourself, you know, th you're going to be in trouble. We could Socrates the, sh the shit out of that. Yeah? Yeah, like, you know, like, h how do they act in this, in this mental realm? How do they act there? What are their effects? I mean, you know, we could just, ugh. I, I don't disagree with you at all, but there's a lot I, to unpack in what you just did. I think that I think it's probably so Socrates' main concern is the effects of rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Who can teach virtue? You, there are people that would sell their rhetorical skill so that you could convince people that you could teach virtue, but you couldn't actually. You can do a whole lot with words. Um, I remember uh, about 30 years ago when I read Alan Bloom's The Closing of the American Mind, he made this point writing back then that everybody's got headphones on now. We have much more words and music and media, and now it's even worse, going into our minds all the time. I mean, how many images did you see per day in Katusa in the 1980s, whenever it was when you were in the high school? I mean, not, my, not many. You'd walk to school, you'd walk home. You, know, you, you wouldn't have a constant, but if you did it now, you'd have your headphones on and you'd be listening to something. We, uh... The Walkman era showed up, you know, about midway through my school career, you know, but they were expensive and not very many people had one. We played cards on the bus. We were on a stupid bus, like an hour and a half one way, you know, <laughs> we'd play cards on the bus, had a little folding, a little magnetic chess set. We'd play chess on the bus, sing songs, fight. <laughs> it sounds wonderful to me. Yeah. <laughs> Better than, you know, letting the social media giants tell you what you ought to think about stuff. I learned so many dirty jokes on the bus. <laughs> I've got daughters and I always worried about the school bus because it was just, it was just. It's unsupervised. It was Lord of the Flies on there. Things happen below the top level of the seat. <laughs> I've heard that's true. <laughs> Be very careful. So uh, if. We have more words than ever. We have many more words going into our brain cases than Socrates probably ever did. Yeah. All the time, every day. And if you don't realize that words are weapons or weaponish, you're at their mercy. If you don't know, like I think everybody, maybe everybody doesn't have to take formal logic, but they probably ought to go through the informal fallacies just so that you can know the easiest tricks to manipulate you. Yeah. And be aware of them because they're used all the time. They're used all the time. And if you don't know them, if you don't know uh, logic at all, you're an easy mark. Yeah. Equivocation is the one I see the most. You know, people talk about straw man and appeal to authority and all these you know fallacies and stuff. But the one that kind of goes unrecognized the most, I think, is equivocation all of the gammas that argued with me about problematicism. They wanted to make the argument about, no, it's a valid word. It's in the dictionary. and People have used it for 400 years. I'm talking about the concept, which is mm -hmm. a poisonous, disgusting, broken, metaphysically evil concept. I wasn't talking about whether the words in the dictionary and whether people use the damn thing or not, but they equivocate and I can't get them off their equivocation because they don't have enough sense or training or something to get off of it. So we can't have a talk. We can't even talk about how to talk because I can't get them to come off of that. Yeah. People need to know their fallacies. So she makes all these arguments about why, why education has failed. Yeah. And then the flip side of that coin is like how we might fix it, how we might fix it. So at this point, if you're reading it, you should have been worried if you don't know, she makes a point, which I can't find at the moment, that if you don't know logic, if you don't know the trivium, then you are going to react emotionally to everything. And perhaps this is by design. Oh, she, she knew better than anybody. She's in advertising. Yeah. The other people that knew this better than her, they killed at Nuremberg. Right. Really. So she's super worried about the future by the way, you should read this. We all, we should say this at the beginning of every show. Stop right now and go mm -hmm. find it. It's all over the internet, The Lost Tools of Learning, Dorothy Sayer. And about two-thirds of the way through, she says, let's talk about how to fix it. And she sets a bunch of preconditions. She says, let us make a clean sweep of all the educational authorities. Let's furnish ourselves with a nice little school of boys and girls whom we may experimentally equip for the intellectual conflict 
along lines chosen by ourselves. Okay, sounds good. No, no we're going to get rid of the other schools and we're going to run a run our own little school here in the. Yep. And then she says one. I actually I say one, one. <laughs> we will endow them with exceptionally docile parents. <laughs> Does she say that, Carl, because she doesn't want them to fight her about how they're going to be schooled? Or does she think that that leads to a particularly educable kind of child? I think she wants parents who will trust her. Okay. We will staff our school with teachers who are themselves perfectly familiar with the aims and methods of the trivium. The trivium are the classical liberal arts, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And we'll talk about that some more. We will have our buildings and our staff large enough to allow our classes to be small enough for adequate handling. And we will postulate a board of examiners willing and qualified to test the products we turn out. Thus prepared, we will attempt to sketch out a syllabus, a modern trivium with modifications. And we'll see where we get to. Mm -hmm. How old will they be? Catch them young. That's what she says. Those are her words. <laughs> Catch them young. <laughs> well, I like the way she describes it. That She says it's funny. It's a funny essay. She's so, so charming. I'm the only child I know, and I remember what I was like. And so she describes three states in her life, the pole parrot, the pert, and the poetic. And uh, she uses alliteration because she worked in advertising and she knows how to do these things. Pole parrot stage would, is when you uh, can learn by heart pretty easily, and it's not a chore. You're a great mimic like the parrot. Yeah, and you could sit and do multiplication tables, and it, it's not drudgery to you. When you learned multiplication tables, did they play that record for you? Oh, it's so long in the midst of time. I... <laughs> so in Katusa, K2C, they put an album on for the threes. And it's just this with a little song and this lady with one times three is uh, two times three. Is, uh, and you would just sing along with it. And we would do that. And nobody got, we were fine with it. Yep. We do surely English with our kids, and there's all kinds of jingles that they have to do. A verb shows action, you know. Am as are was, do as did, has have had, sometimes should, shall would and should, yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it's fine. That's the age to do it. When you're 48 trying to do that, you know, maybe that's why it's harder to learn languages when you're older. It's because you just can't bear to do the, the drill anymore. Uh, so that's a time to learn to to learn stuff that needs memorization the pert age which is when you're a little snot when you start contradicting people she says it sits about in the lower fourth i'm not sure what age that is i can't translate english ages is uh that's t you got to start teaching them logic and then the poetic age which she says is the difficult age that rather specializes in being misunderstood. Both you and I have teenage daughters. I think we have some in the poet. Well, I know I have some in the poetic age. <laughs> you just don't understand. Right. <laughs> and life becomes very dramatic. So that would be a time <laughs> to, to go to rhetoric. So it maps pretty well. So we have pull parrot for grammar. That's a time to learn how the language works dialectic or logic to the pert she's already a pain in the ass you might as well teach her logic right and then rhetoric they love to argue yeah might as well teach them how and then rhetoric to when they start becoming uh more you know moody i guess i wonder if this works for boys do boys ever get to the poetic age or oh yeah i think so i think the poetic age for boys is uh, when they want to start they start wanting to homestead they want to differentiate. They want to mm -hmm. self-actualize. Yeah. Their attempts at being understood and their attempts at expression look different than they do for the female, but they are real nonetheless. Yeah. Yep. Then she's got recommendations. Grammar means what it sounds like. It means grammar. You need to actually study the structure of language. And sadly, the way we teach English now and probably the way we teach Spanish doesn't do this very much. It's mostly just talk at them till they talk back at you. Right. So she does recommend Latin. I, I think that's a good recommendation too. I studied Latin in high school uh, for four years and I still read it a little bit. I think studying Latin and forgetting it will do you much more good than studying Spanish and never using it. It's a good language to forget having learned. Does that make sense? Sure. 
she says, and I wanted to ask you this. I wrote a question. I wrote this down to ask Carl. Well, and you taught Latin too, right? You taught yes. at the university, right? So yeah. you've got some Latin. You don't suck at that. I'll just let that hang there. <laughs> Even uh, she she says even a rudimentary knowledge of Latin cuts down the labor and pains of learning almost any other subject by at least fifty percent. Is that so? Um, any other subject? Uh, well, certainly any other language. Which page is that on? Uh, I'm I'm using... Forty-two. Forty-two. Uh, he's referring to page forty-two of the online Great Books Handbook. Yes, which you can get, I believe, if you sign up for the waiting list. Is that? Or is it when nope. you actually sign up? You have to actually sign up to get this. Yeah, this has kind of got some of the secret sauce in it. It has our whole like reading list, and you know, and I held that hostage because you know, you know, I want you to do it with us. Uh, you can't learn it well unless you're thinking in an orderly manner. Um, it has cases, so cases are uh, ways that a noun can relate to the rest of the sentence. We have three in English, two that two that you can recognize by looking at them. We have the, the subjective and the objective case, and we used to actually use them. So uh, who and whom, hmm. I and me, that would be subject, object. We also have indirect object, but it doesn't have a different ending. People that have Latin always know when to use who and whom. Right. And you should too, Except dear listener. <laughs> It drives me up a wall. I, I know the world's gone away from this, but as for me and my family, we're going to say whom. When? <laughs> At the right time. Well, Latin has, depending on how you slice it, five or seven cases, and they have different endings, and it's all the different ways that a noun can relate to other words. It forces you to think about that, and it probably sets the stage for logic. My youngest daughter told me last night that if you would say he, you use who. If you'd say him, you use whom. Yeah. I said, hey, that's pretty good, girl. Yeah, that's that's. I'll that's follow good. that away. I, I think she's probably right. If you study Latin grammar, you're going to know a lot more about the way the world exists because you're going to have to think about it. Like, there's a simple past tense, which means I did it. Then there's the, um, that, that would be the perfect. It's You did it and it's done. And then there is the imperfect, which is... I am doing, or I was doing this, which means you did it, but it might be continuing. My favorite is the future perfect. I will have been doing it. Yeah, you do something <laughs> in the future before something else in the future. Yeah. And I, I will have been coaching for 10 years by next year, you know, something like that. And it, it, by thinking about that, you don't get that by just doing C and say English in your, in your local school. You yeah. don't think about the relations of time and reality like you do struggling through Latin grammar. You don't have to become expert in it. You just need to spend a couple of years on it, get yourself thinking that way, and yeah, you'll be better off. And she says, don't read – well, she doesn't say it explicitly like this, but she's not so interested in reading the Romans. She says she wants to read the medieval Latin, which was a living language down mm -hmm. to the end of the Renaissance. Yep. She says it is easier and in some ways livelier, both in syntax and rhythm – and a study of it helps dispel the widespread notion that learning and literature came to a full stop when Christ was born and only woke up again in the dissolution of the monasteries. Right. No Dark Ages for Dorothy Sayer. Nope. Nope. Dark Ages is an uh, invention of yeah. historians. Yeah, they weren't dark. There exists a biography of George Washington written by some Ohio school teacher hmm. in the 1800s. Latin's been alive for a long, long time. It's still kind of, sort of alive. Oh, wait a it's minute. It's a little bit alive. Wrote, she, the high school teacher wrote a Latin George Washington biography. Yeah. I'll be damned. Yeah. You can find it on one of the big search engines. You know, the language, I'm being somebody that doesn't have any Latin. This show's going to be two episodes, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> being somebody that doesn't have any Latin, though, I do have the Oxford Latin Dictionary, which uh -huh. claims to have all the Latin words in it. And it's about, it's a big old book. It's folio size and it's 900 pages and it's probably in 10 point font. So there's, there's a lot of stuff in there, but I also have the Oxford English dictionary, the one, and it's 26,000 pages or something like that. Uh, so Latin, Latin's a lot tighter 
and a lot more carefully defined. And I, I think in some ways it would be easier to speak in technical terms with a language that was inflected like that with so many cases mm -hmm. and fewer words. More words can lead to unnecessary nuance. Right. If the place where you go to worship is a of a traditional kind, you might like Latin just because nothing changes in Latin. Right. Things don't drift. In English, things drift. Words change meaning. But because Latin is mostly dead, not all the way dead, mostly dead, uh, words do not change their meaning. So whatever Augustus wrote, he wrote like a few, you can read his last will in test, Testament, but whatever uh, Julius Caesar wrote, it means the same thing now that it did then. It's the math of language. <laughs> right. Ah, right. I just came up with that. Hambrickian. Yes, I like that. <laughs> Gosh, I like what I come up with. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, but she says in the poll parrot stage, they should be digging into that. And I like to think of grammar in terms of the trivium as not just Latin or English grammar or whatever, but also just picking apart the bones of subjects. And so she wants kids in the poll parrot stage, in the grammar stage, to be learning the parts of everything. Dates mm -hmm. in history, for example. Mm -hmm. Little pieces of poetry and who wrote them science she says that science for the pole parrot stage is largely about collecting here are deciduous leaves here are conifers etc so that they just are just because they can memorize so uh by rote so easily that you can pack their brains with information that will eventually be organized yeah. in the in the logic phase and start to create a world for them boy i wish i had done that I wish I had memorized all that stuff. Which I know stuff? an oak tree. I know a maple tree. Right. I might be able to pull out a catalpa or a locust, but... Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species? Oh, gosh. I don't know. I, I think I probably went to the pert stage early, and then I didn't memorize all the things I should memorize. Four crooks broke in as the fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, the halides. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't do real well on that stuff. At one point, I knew all the bones in the body. Whoa, no kidding? Yeah, high school anatomy, and then I forgot them. You could probably resurrect that. I need to. I need to do Rebecca Krieg's anatomy course. Yeah, you could You could get that one. Yeah, so for the youngster, the very young grammar school kid, they're learning their multiplication tables. They're learning some arithmetic. Uh, science is largely about collecting and classifying at that point. Dates. Uh, a bunch of stories, too. St yeah. They ought to, like, you, you were going to get that Collier series. Getting it. Go to Indiegogo and go order the new Collier's Junior Classics that uh, that is being kicked off. They It's a 10-book series of just Aesop's fables and all these great stories that kids used to all know. Yeah, your little poll parrot is probably not ready for great books discussions, but should know some of these basic stories. The fox and the grapes. They need to know that stuff. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you a vocabulary in which to think. Uh, and it might take a while before you think about the stories very much, but at least you know the story. I think it probably enriches your imagination in a better way than, you know, just letting kids do whatever they want. Right. I like the taxonomy. I think I like the dates. I like knowing some dates in history. You should know when some things happened. I remember uh, teaching a medieval philosophy or medieval humanities course. I think it was in the first week or two. I asked about the Roman Empire. Mm. And I asked, when did it end? Nobody knew. I'm not sure I know. 350? That's like 450 something. Okay. The exact date. But I, I was going to give them credit if they got within 200 years, and they, they had no idea. Sweet. I would have got those sweet, sweet points. It's actually a disputed point because I think it actually ended in 1453 when Constantinople right. was conquered by the Turks, but... We'll get it back. <laughs> I was going to make the point that when you think it ends, that's when Gibbon thought it ended, but it really kept going for a thousand years. But I couldn't even get to that point because they didn't know when it ended. They had no sense of when Roman Empire was in their historical map. What are the five big dates? Five big dates? Gosh, I haven't figured them out. Jesus is a big date. Zero. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Although there wasn't really a year zero. It goes from minus one to one. Okay. Uh, for me, uh, 1054, Great Schism. 1066. 
1066 Battle of Hastings for you. Yeah, English. Yep. That's when those frogs took over. Uh, for me, 1453. Okay. Fall of Constantinople. I think that's a big deal, but because we're focused on the western part of the western end, we generally mm -hmm. don't think about it. Um, 1776. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, boy, how many have I gotten so far? I think that's four. <laughs> so I just need one more? Yeah. Can I do founding of Rome, 753 BC? Okay, okay. But then you fill in dates around that. So if I think about uh, Moses, I'm going to think, well, it's about maybe 400 years before the founding of Rome. Right. And now I have him on my playing field. Right. You're Rather organizing than... you're organizing time in your mind by doing this. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, 0 1066 1776 1914 1941. Yeah. Something happened in 1914. The whole thing went to hell. <laughs> and when was online great books started? When was that started? 2017? We opened enrollment, I think, on January 7th of 2018. But I started work on the whole thing in the September of 2017. Yeah, so you don't need too many dates. You just need a, a few. And then you can, when you read some history, you can stick it there. And once you have all these factoids in your head, you're just a little fount of, not, of information. Uh, but when you move into that PERT phase, they have to start doing something with it. And that's when we install logic and uh, get the youngster to start to use discursive reason. Yeah. I really love that she calls it the pert stage. Yeah. I remember being such a pain in the ass. Seems Just... like only yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that's the time. Grab these kids and, and teach them logic. Yeah. I know a young man who um, got into debate, the debate club about, you know, eighth grade, you know. And that's about when she's talking about that and just thrived on that because he's just an argumentative little jerk, you know, <laughs> but you funneled all of that right where it needed to be. So good. Right. So rather than taking the kid who is a pain in the ass and saying, you're a pain in the ass, we're going to give you detention, you know, or we're going to restrict this part of you and make you fit the school model. Just shut up, sit down and go to your next class. But, ah, you're a pain in the ass now. Now it's time to learn some new stuff. You're going to get your black belt and ass pain. <laughs> so, uh, debate and logic and discursive so, rhetoric. So here's the quote I, I was looking for before. I think this is uh, page 48, maybe. Logic has been discredited. We don't teach logic very much anymore. Logic has been discredited partly because we've fallen into the habit of supposing that we are conditioned almost entirely by the intuitive and the unconscious. There is no time now to argue whether this is true. I will content myself with observing that to neglect the proper training of the reason is the best possible way to make it true and to ensure the supremacy of the intuitive, irrational, and unconscious elements in our makeup. So there's there's a bit there's a bit in there. People think um, we're not rational. Uh, emotions are primary. Uh, my emotions trump your truth. You know, if my hurt feelings are more important than your truth, whether or not that's true, I don't think it is. But the reason why we're inclined to think it's true is because we don't study logic. And if we don't, we don't have study, anything else, if we don't study logic, we'll make it true. Well, there is nothing if, if you don't have any. And, and most people have some, you know, but if you don't have much, it's not powerful in you. Then it is all it is. There is intuition and emotion. Yeah. And so the argument, rather than being hey, you said something interesting that I don't agree with. Let's dissect it and see who's right. It becomes, you say something different from what I feel. Therefore, you are worthless, horrible. People say all the time, I feel like uh, guacamole's problematic or whatever. <laughs> and they don't feel it. They, they either, they think it or they have a notion that fill in the blank. I hear it all the time. My kids will do it every now and then. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> no. He was just wagging the finger. Yeah, we, right we're going to talk about what you think about this or what you believe about it. Uh, no, I feel like whatever. I just feel that we need to take into account more experiences and different perspectives. I feel like uh, prisons should all be uh, publicly operated. Feel what? Maybe you're Who, right, but what do you feel about it? Like, you know, does it make your butt tingle? Like, what are you talking about? What do you feel? I, I feel like vanilla is the best ice cream. 
wait a minute, that might be true <laughs> that you feel that because you can't, there, there's no like best ice cream yardstick that we can all agree on. Right, that one right. might be actually be true. But if you say, I feel like the fed should be audited. No, you don't. Right. Well, the, you, the, you need to have reasons or go home. <laughs> the point of the, the example is that, uh, yeah, it's true that I have this feeling about vanilla ice cream, but it has no uh, truth value outside of me. Right. It doesn't make you like vanilla ice cream. Me saying that I feel, if I say I feel something should be the case, that's not an argument. Uh. I think that it should be the case. Now I give you reasons. Reasons are publicly accessible. You and I can talk about the reasons. We can examine the logic. But my feelings takes it away from anything that you can contribute to. And all we can do is fight about whose feelings are backed by more force. Let me tell you what I'm feeling right now. Yes. When we, In all of this talk about this, I literally feel disgusted. I feel it in my face like uh, like I smelled something like rotten. <laughs> and, and I've just started shutting down. Because that's what I, and I think that's normal, right? If somebody's like, "Oh, I've got these big feelings about X, Y, Z," th that's inaccessible. I mean, there's nothing that we can do about that, and it, it, and there's nothing you can do in the face of somebody spiraling out on how they feel about the school to prison pipeline or whatever. But shut down and withdraw from it. You can either concede or withdraw. Yeah, I mean, maybe they're both concessions, but yeah, ugh. yeah. you can't argue it. it the, I feel this way. Because you love me or whatever, you should feel the same way I feel. Right. It's a dirty trick. It's something uh, my grandmother might have done. Right. Oh, no. Just emotional manipulation rather than logic. In this PERT stage, we move from reading narrative and uh, lyric stuff to essays with arguments and criticism in them, she says. And then we move our math uh, on from just arithmetic to the more abstract stuff, algebra Geometry. Hmm. I think this is this is where Euclid needs to be. I mean, the, the, you, you learn logic; it just teaches so much. This is where Euclid should come in. And then history, she says, we start to uh, you know fill in those blanks um, between the dates, and we talk about. And she says we talk about. Well, we use history as suitable material for discussion. Was the behavior of this statesman justified? What was the effect of such an enactment? What are the arguments for and against this or that form of government? History as just factoids is useless without the discursive element that she's talking about, where you question, what the heck happened? Was Caesar justified in his treatment of the, the Gallic people? You know, yeah. whatever. So, so you go into, I remember history classes, we would have questions like, what were the causes of the Civil War? And the answer you're supposed to give is a some list that the teacher has said to you, rather than here are the facts. Let us analyze. We need to do a whole show on that. <laughs> what were the causes of the Civil War? You know, the Civil War is long ago. Uh, the point of it is as a use for you to work through logic. As for you to think better. It's like angels on the he head of a pin. Yeah. Okay. Did you ever have anyone teach, I'm making the air quotes, about the Civil War and say anything about the Monroe Doctrine in that? Mm, I don't remember it. I think you should. Knowing that our foreign policy had, at that time, and today even, has been influenced by the Monroe Doctrine, how might that have influenced the federal government when... They had to deal with the secession of other states and the formation of a new nation on that continent. Mm -hmm. Intolerable yep. doing that, but they never they never talk about it. They never talk about anything really. You get your Scott Forsman, Houghton Mifflin, you know, textbook out, and, 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 and people that really actually want to learn things don't go to textbooks. Right. Textbooks are this right. weird animal that's just like it's the silo that she doesn't like. You know, you don't go to textbooks. That could be a poll quote for the whole episode. You should say it again. What did I say? People that really want to learn anything no. don't go to the textbook. No, it's true. There are these odd figments. There's these kind of mud creatures that people put together. They're written by committees in the state of California. Yeah. Because that's the biggest textbook market. California and Texas. Texas. And we know what happens at the Texas School Book Depository. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, we do. 
but they're not written like uh, C.S. Lewis had a line on this associative Dottie, Dottie Lee. I believe it's in his book on Athanasius. It's an introduction. He just writes the introduction to the book and he says, why would you read a textbook? Why would you read a textbook written by a mediocrity when you can read the actual text written by the genius? Yeah. So don't read about Athanasius. He wrote his own books. You can read him. That's a rule for life. Yeah, I agree. Yep. She says, uh, never neglect the material which is so abundant in the pupil's own daily life. Uh, She says, uh, there is a delightful passage in Leslie Paul's The Living Hedge, which which tells how a number of small boys enjoyed themselves for days arguing about an extraordinary shower of rain which had fallen in their town. A shower so localized that it left one half of the main street wet and the other dry. Could one, they argued, properly say that it had rained that day on or over the town or only in the town? How many drops of water were required to constitute rain? And so on. (laughs) Sounds like Thanksgiving when I was a kid. Yeah. I had a group of friends there at K2C Junior High School, and we would would argue stuff like this for weeks. You know, and you can only argue at lunch and, you know, in between classes stuff or before school or whatever. We would argue stuff like that for weeks. And from the outside, I'm outside not fighting. Right. My my mom would always say, quit fighting. We're not fighting. We're arguing. It doesn't matter. Does it really matter if rain fell in the town? Nope. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Oh, what's a pop tart? <laughs> I was it, talking that w- about that with my youngest one today. Is it a pastry? Is it a pastry? Is it a sandwich? Is it a tart? Is it a tart? If you seal the edges, is it no longer a sandwich? Like, I don't, I don't, even, yeah, we I don't know. It. But wherever the matter for dialect is found, it is, of course, highly important that attention should be focused upon the beauty and economy of a fine demonstration or a well-turned argument, lest veneration should wholly die. So that's what she wants. Uh, that's what she wants happening for the, the young person in the pert age. She says, it will doubtless be objected that to encourage young persons at the pert age to browbeat, correct, and argue with their elders will render them perfectly intolerable. My answer is that children of that age are intolerable anyhow, and that their natural <laughs> argumentativeness may just as well be canalized to good purpose and is allowed to run away into the sands. I'm going to steal that word, canalized. Yeah, C-A, like canal That's wonderful. I was a, a, a difficult student for my teachers. (laughs) You don't say. They didn't know what to do. Well, I was, I was a little smarter than the rest of the class. Oh, they hated me so much. (laughs) They didn't know what to do with me. They'd send me to the library or something. You know, this would have been perfect for me. Yeah. I had one teacher that she had me do something that was pretty good. So this is Miss Hanks. She is still alive. She is a Facebook friend of mine. Huh. Uh, We should have her on the show. She had me write up a summary of the rules of English grammar. That's a chore. Start to finish. I loved it. Do you have it? No, I don't have it. Oh, crap. But she didn't know what to do with me, so she made me do something. This big task to, or you know, all all the rules, how to diagram, everything. We could just throw out strunk and white. (laughs) Just have... Shoots grammar. I, I appreciate that she did that. I'm not sure I ever thanked her. Well, if she listens to the podcast. She says that the teachers, though, and and this lady was feeling the pressure probably, when you educate the children in this way, they will take every opportunity to insert the point of the critical wedge, and that wedge will go home the more forcibly under the weight of the dialectical hammer wielded by the practice hand. So the teachers are going to have to get their game on point or the kids are going to eat them alive, which is where you want to be. Right, right. So what about the poetic age? Now you've gone through the the pert stage, and you're no longer a pain in the ass. You are now mopey. You're dressed in black. You're listening to Pink Floyd. That's what I did. I listened to a lot of Pink Floyd and thought deep thoughts. Pink Floyd's (laughs) gross. (laughs) What do you do then with young Carl, who is now starting to get weepy and experiencing existential angst you focus them on expression through artful rhetoric Mm, artful rhetoric yeah so rhetoric would be distinguished from grammar grammar is how to speak logic would be how to argue rhetoric would be how to speak beautifully 
Yep. Do you think that's appropriate? Yeah, I like that. Dottie Lee has been talking about how the, sh- the charlatans and bad people will manipulate you with language. Well, they shouldn't have all the fun. You can use rhetoric at the service of truth, and you probably have to. Yeah, rhetoric is now a poisoned word that we just think of as just strictly polemic. But you need to use rhetoric just to make your point in the best way possible with people you care about. Even In the best way possible, in a way that's memorable, in a way that we, we are not merely intellects. We have more than just intellect, and you have to appeal to more than just intellect. Uh, I've been poking through the a little bit of Shakespeare since reading Harold Bloom. The first like 19 sonnets are to this young man encouraging him to to have babies. Mm. They're an act of rhetoric. And so Bill Shakespeare could have just written, young man, go get married, have babies. Instead, it's, I should have come ready with a quote. You can, you can dig them up yourself, but it's, it's a whole bunch of glorious 14-line sonnets telling him all the reasons why his beauty is going to die. And yet, if he used his beauty well, I sent you the one about the financial analogy, mm-hmm. that if he made use of, of the beauty that he had, like the beauty was a fund, it would produce its own executor, which is an interesting interesting conceit. But that's all rhetoric. That The bare point could be made, but the bare point might not persuade. Right. You make the bare point, you end up with dog moms. <laughs> yeah, we need a maybe we need to rewrite those sonnets. So at about age fourteen, you start moving these kids into a study of of rhetoric, and they're going to write a lot. They're going to speak a lot. They're going to take all this information that they got in the pert stage. I'm sorry, in the pull parrot stage, this logic and this ability to uh, to uh, define their terms and to create arguments. And now they're going to learn to craft beautiful arguments. Uh, with more, uh, I don't know, more artful terms and uh, speak convincingly and beautifully to other people. Well, what then? You know, we, we homeschooled our kids for a whole long time. Mm-hmm. And then the oldest one, she turned 16 and she said, there's a school in town and you can take a la carte classes there. And I want to take these two classes there. And here's why. Okay. You're 16 years old. You had reasons that make good sense. You can make decisions. I hate schools, but I'm in. I'm supportive. Let's go. Let's do it. So this little school is uh, is trivium-based school. And the older kids, when they're in this deep rhetoric stage, not at age 14, but by the time they're 16, 17 years old, teach certain subjects to the little kids. That's part of the rhetoric thing. Yeah. They have to hone their communication skills to the point that they can pass on other conceptual information to younger people. And the model at this little school is just fantastic. Well, and I like that she's able to, um, well, she's being Sayersian Mm -hmm. because she's starting to specialize. Mm -hmm. So she's in the rhetoric stage. So the the trivium are not the subject matter courses. No. They're the how to learn courses. But at some point you will have figured out things that interest you and you might have done your rhetorical pieces on you know, sewage and um, price of salmon or whatever it is you're interested in. And, you know, you've got your library card and you go read a whole bunch of stuff about that. But now you know how to do it. And then you say, Dad, I think I want to go to welding school or I I think I want to go into quilt make. I don't know. What do people? Whatever. Who knows? I want to go study. I I want to be a farmer. Well, I bet you'd be a good one. Having learned how to learn. Right. Right. Yep. Let's go to the county extension office, pick up a bunch of materials about how, about that. You need to start right now. You need to start figuring out what you're going to plant in a little garden in the backyard because we don't have 60 acres mm-hmm. and it's game on. Yeah. Well, we did that Emerson podcast. In order to be self-reliant, you have to be the kind of person that can go and do something. There has to be a self too. Damn it. Yeah. So this kid now knows... Con- the kid can do it. And if the kid comes in, which might seem a strange, farming is a good example. I want to be a farmer. Who's a farmer anymore? I want to be, okay, good. But now you could go do it. You're equipped to go do it. You're equipped to figure it out. Whereas a, a lot of people, there's a lot of stuff that's not even open as a possibility to them because they think, well, then I'd have to go to school for it. And 
if they've got their grammar, their logic, and their rhetoric, and they're identifying terms and arguments, and they're they aren't in, not a hundred percent intuitive emotional beings, they'll be able to know if they were wrong. Mm-hmm. Ooh, farming isn't for me for the following reasons that I've identified through my research and my yeah. you know tr- attempted mastery of the agricultural world. Boom, 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 boom. This is why I should not be a farmer. And now, in finding out that you are unfarmerly, you know a whole lot more about yourself than you did when you thought you were. Right. Now you're going to be better suited to the next thing that you try to tackle. Right. Because our young country lad starts a newspaper, teaches a school, buys a township. He does all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yes, this is, to use a modern phrase, this is empowering. I know that's a terrible word. It's a terrible, terrible word. But in the real sense, this would be that. It's giving you the tools to do stuff. Yeah, these are the tools. The tools are grammar, logic, and rhetoric. They aren't, they, and, and they defy silos. She talks over and over in here about rights and over and over in here about using history, about using math, about using science to teach how to learn. The material that you use to teach how to learn doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the process. And when she starts to wrap this up, before concluding these necessarily very sketchy suggestions, she says, I ought to say why I think it necessary in these days to go back to a discipline which we had discarded. The truth is that for the last 300 years or so, we have been living upon our educational capital. The post-Renaissance world, bewildered and excited by the profusion of new subjects offered to it, broke away from the old discipline, which had indeed become sadly dull and stereotyped in its practical application, and imagined that henceforward it could, as it were, disport itself happily in its new and extended quadrivium without passing through the trivium. So the quadrivium, Yuns, are the five, I'm sorry, the four liberal arts that that you move on to after the trivium. And those are geometry, music theory, astronomy, and what? Arithmetic, I believe. Ar- arithmetic. Um, and she says, we now have this extended quadrivium, which might, and I think she's right. Accounting, uh, home economics, bio, whatever. And, and we do, we pass right through the trivium, not even through it. People don't even do it any longer. This is crucial. Everybody, for the last 300 years or so, we've been living upon our educational capital. Mm-hmm. There is a reason why we haven't been back to the moon. And it's not funding. Yes. So this is for kids. Well, it's not for kids. The lecture was for adults, but it is an educational program for children. What if you're not a child? It's what tougher. do you do? And you realize that you got screwed. I realized this. When did you, how when did you realize it? I I don't know that I can pinpoint a date, but I went to. Were you in your thirties when you're? 20s? I was in my my twenties. I studied engineering because it's what you do in my family. I have a couple of diplomas that say engineering on it, and then I had a detour. I spent a little time in Wagner County. That means you went to jail. <laughs> No, I'm in the jailhouse now. No, I, I spent a little time in a Catholic seminary and had to take philosophy and was pleased to take philosophy. And that, that mm. kind of, um, it, it was Socrates. Yeah. You know, uh, well, I don't really know what I think I know and I don't know why I think it. And I needed to get better at that. And so I've been trying to reverse engineer a liberal arts education for ever since then. Yeah, me too. Uh, um, and it's hard. I wish I'd done it as a child. I, I didn't have a, as educations go, I didn't have a bad education, but it could have been better. Yeah. About six, seven years ago now, I was sitting at, uh, in my office with a, a young friend who at that time was about 16 years old and was trying to wrap up his high school career and figure out what to do with himself. And, uh, he ended up starting a business and never went to college and, has done very well. And we were talking about what we wanted to do with ourselves. And I said, well, I, I need to go get the trivium. I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> he says, you're, you know, you're so strange. And, and he's a member of my, my home book group. 
Yeah. And has been since the first day and he's 23 now and, and we're still, we're all still wrestling with this stuff. And, um, so that's, that's when that started to happen for me. So you say, what does an adult do? Well, the adult doesn't really probably, probably doesn't have to do a whole lot of that pole parrot stuff. We probably know our multiplication tables. Mm-hmm. We've got some of these dates in our minds. We know, you know, we took some biology and we, you know, we've got a lot of that stuff. If you find that there are some of those things that you don't have, like you don't know, you know, if you took history in public schools in the last 30 years, you really don't know many dates prior to like Jamestown, 1603, you know, maybe you need to go get a few of those kinds of things, but you'll have most of that. And then you're to the, the grammar, or I'm sorry, the logic part. And, you know, you need to go get some logic. You probably need to read some of the beautiful arguments in Plato. You need to go read some Aristotle. You need to go make a study. Uh, there, there are, every book is called Introduction to Logic. Go get yeah. one of those. There's a thing called the Binder Trivium, which a little nonprofit group has put together. You can go find that and download it for free or give them a, a little donation. And it'll help you with grammar and logic. And then, uh, you know, read these great books. I think that yep. we get a great deal of the logic stuff because we learn how to identify terms and arguments. Uh, Adler teaches us or gives us a guideline for how to do that in his book, How to Read a Book. And then when we speak and argue and debate about this stuff and discuss them in seminar, that's where we get the rhetoric chunk. And write. And write. Mm-hmm. Write about things you think. Off you go. And then you'll just get better at it and you, and you can never stop. <laughs> yeah, you're never done. Uh, yeah, if you're... Our age, language is going to be tricky, but not impossible. Ugh. Not impossible, but it's tricky. Not. A little bit of Latin would repay you a lot if you can manage it. If you can't do that, I think actually a, a good book for a lot of the grammar is Sister Miriam Joseph's book on the trivium. Yep. You might be able to work through her talk about grammar and then maybe skip the Latin Although you should do the Latin if you can. Yeah. What else are you going to do with your life? Yeah. Go watch, you know, I don't know, the Vikings. (laughs) Are they the good football team these days? I don't have any idea. I don't know. I know the Bears have played some games. (laughs) That's all I know about what they... I don't know. I don't know. Miss Sayer says, we have lost the tools of learning. The axe and the wedge, the hammer and the saw, the chisel and the plane that were so adaptable to all tasks. Instead of them, we have merely a set of complicated jigs, each of which will do but one task and no more. And in using which eye and hand receiving no training so that no man ever sees the work as whole or looks to the end of the work. What uses it to pile task on task and prolong the days of labor if at the close the chief object is left unattained? And it's not the fault of the teachers. They work only too hard already. The combined folly of a civilization that has forgotten its own roots is forcing them to shore up the tottering weight of an educational structure that is built upon sand. They are doing for the pupils the work which the pupils themselves ought to do. For the sole true end of education is simply this, to teach men how to learn for themselves. And whatever instruction fails to do this is effort spent in vain. That's Miss Sayer, one of our patron saints. <laughs> She's my friend. Yep. I've spent a lot of time with her. She's my friend. Well, there is another online great books podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, We've had a few uh, very kind reviews on iTunes. Thank you for doing that. If you have time, please go to iTunes and give us a five-star review. That helps uh, us gain some uh, search uh, credit. Maybe, you know, we've got some people out there we need to crush. (laughs) There are some other podcasts we need to vanquish and defeat. (laughs) <laughs> we need to gather some podcast skulls. So, <laughs> Saddle up. That's right. So go out there and give us a review. That's a big help to us. And uh, pass this on to a friend. Send a link to the show. Uh, if you're a homeschool person, if you're a uh, math and science person who didn't get the kind of rhetoric, artsy kind of piece, go read Dorothy Sayer and get started on this Trivium stuff for yourself. It ain't too late. Also, enrollment opens soon, so you can go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash podcast, and you can uh, join our VIP waiting list. Or, if enrollment is open, you can join, and since you, uh, you're you one of our favorite people because you listen to the show, you'll get 25% off your first three months with us. Anything else, Carl? Uh, no, I think that's it. Come join us. Yeah, follow us on Instagram, by the way. We have the finest Great Books Instagram account in the known universe. 
It's at online great books. There's lots of library porn. Yeah, library porn, book porn, nerdy book memes. It's a delight. No butt pictures. No. No butt pictures. Thank you guys for listening. Talk to you soon.